Hi, I'm Susie Larson. Thank you for listening to Susie Larson Live. Faith Radio podcasts are only possible because of your support. So thanks for giving and thanks for sharing with a friend. It's only just a matter of Welcome to Suzy Larson Live. Always so honored to get to spend this time with you. In fact, I look forward to bringing you conversations every single day that hopefully inspire you in your faith walk, that deepen your understanding of God's Word, and that heightens your awareness of His very real presence in your life. I want you to imagine how strange it must have been for the first Christians to break with culture norms, to follow a God they could not see. Uh, a God that asked for full devotion for their whole lives, for complete surrender and trust, and one that promised to perform miracles in and through them and transform them from the inside out. Imagine how that must have looked to the bystanders all around them. Have we watered down what it means to follow Jesus to such a degree that it's no longer compelling, intriguing, or even fascinating to the outside world? Dr. Nijay Gupta joins me today to talk about his really amazing new book, Strange Religion, how the first Christians were weird, dangerous, and compelling. We're going to get them on in a moment, but I have a quick announcement for you. We've got an app. It's free, and we're upgrading it all the time. And uh, you can live stream the shows from anywhere, listen to podcasts later on after the fact. It's really a great way even to listen in your car, because if you hit one of those pockets where your radio signal kind of gets weak, the app keeps it nice and strong. It's free. Did I mention that? Go to your app store and just search for Faith Radio Network, and you'll find it there. All right, let me tell you about my guest. We'll get him on the show. Dr. Nijay Gupta is a professor of New Testament at Northern Seminary. Previously, he was professor of New Testament at Portland Seminary, where he also oversaw the master's thesis program and advised doctoral students. He's the author of several books, commentaries, and over a dozen academic articles and theological journals. He's a brilliant man, but what I said before the show is was praying for him. I feel like his, his brilliant mind is second to his beautiful heart. He has a humble, profound, and deep love for God. Dr. Gupta, welcome back to the show. Hi, Susie. So glad to be with you again. Looking forward to the conversation. Before we dig into your awesome book, I just want to know in your in your times with the Lord these days, what's he been talking to you about? You know, I, I just this morning I was reading a book of Exodus where it talks, uh, chapter 34, the Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. And the slow to anger part, I actually, I heard this uh, little insight from my friend Tim Mackey. I hope you get a chance to have him on the show if you haven't. But um, Tim uh, reminded me the Hebrew of uh, slow to anger literally says uh, the, 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 the Lord's no, nostrils enlarged. And the idea in the in the Hebrew world was um, when you're mad, your nostrils get hot. They flare hot. And if you have big nostrils, then you can dissipate that heat. And the idea is God has such long and big nostrils, he can be really patient. <laughs> and I just love I just love kind of the silliness of that image, but it really is similar to our uh, idiom of having a short fuse versus a long fuse. Mm. And the idea of being able to go to God in prayer and just say, God, I screwed up, knowing that God has a long fuse and big nostrils. That uh, it's just amazing. It's just a really beautiful image. Wow. What a way to kick off a weird conversation today, truly. I did not <laughs> see that coming. <laughs> I promise you, friends, you'll never hear anything quite like this anywhere else. So, wow, that's amazing. So you had a student one day ask you a question. Yeah. Why did the first Christians uh, refer to themselves as believers? I mean, I had to yeah. pause with that question. Such a great question. But you didn't offer a pat answer. You did a deep dive. And tell us what you found. Yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting. There were three terms that Christians used for themselves in the first, you know, let's say five decades of Christianity. They called themselves brothers and sisters um, as part of this new spiritual family. They called themselves saints or holy people because of the Holy Spirit. But they also called themselves believers. And, I, you know, the student uh, asked this question, and it really put me on a journey of looking at, okay, were there other groups that called themselves believers? And Susan, the interesting thing is there weren't because people in the Roman world, um, they took their religious beliefs for granted. They didn't even think of them as beliefs. They were just facts, you know, that 
you could walk around and see all these statues of all these Roman gods like Jupiter, Juno, Mercury, Venus, Pluto, all these different gods, statues everywhere, temples everywhere in every city, all over the place. Just like Paul says when he goes to Athens, the book of Acts, he was shocked by how many idols there were. You're talking statues, you're talking paraphernalia everywhere. And these Christians call themselves believers, I think because they believe something so radically different than what everybody else believed. Um, they, they defied and contradicted the main religious beliefs of 99.9% .9 of the people in the vast Roman Empire, and that made them weird, and it also made them dangerous because Romans believed that the, the main gods, the Roman gods, were like overlords, and you wanted to keep them happy. You wanted to appease them, and one of the ways you did that was assuming they exist, worshiping them, honoring them, giving sacrifices, submitting to them. And these Christians didn't do these things. So part of calling themselves believers was, hey, we believe something completely different than what everybody else believes. You know, nowadays there's a, a cool stigma attached to weird. Like if you want to be weird, you're cool <laughs> because you're out of the box yeah. and you're not status quo. And you say these Christians weren't trying to be weird for weird's sake. I mean, you write about how you live in Portland and Portland is, you know, yes. the motto is keep Portland weird. But you yep. said they weren't bucking conventions or pop religion to be special and different. I want to read this. You said in their best and most genuine moments, they were simply following Jesus, like mice blindly chasing after the Pied Piper. And as they did so, they deviated from the norm of religion. And whether they were intending to or not, they stood out in society. So it kind of contrast cool weird in our day and dangerous <laughs> weird in their day. Yeah, you know, it, it, one thing I love about living in Portland, Oregon is – you could just dress whatever way you want. There's no like conformity, like wear these kind of jeans or this kind of coat. Um, we do have kind of styles here, but for, for young people, I have three teenagers. It's pretty much choose your adventure <laughs> with mm -hmm. the way you dress. But, but there's a point to make in that of um, there aren't the pressures to conformity here, certainly not in dress. Um, but the Christians, they didn't really think that way. They, In fact, if you take something like the book of Acts, Luke, uh, who also wrote the Gospel of Luke, wrote the book of Acts, he was trying very hard in the book of Acts to explain that on the one hand, Christians are different because they worship a different kind of God. And on the other hand, he tries to explain they're not they're not bad for culture. They're not bad for society. You have the Apostle Paul appearing before all these magistrates and trials, and every time he gets off the hook, because he's able to prove, even though we're different, we're not a threat to goodness. We're not a threat to justice. And so even though Christians can and should be weird in the sense that we only follow our God, um, we actually should be demonstrating at all times that we are good for people. We're good for the world. They were really wanting to be, as you say, respectable members of society, but not to the degree that it would cause them to defy following God. So they, they were yes. living in that tension. Again, they weren't trying to buck society. I think you see people at times, even in the Christian space, where they're, they're proud of of their difference. Do you know what I'm saying? Where they're proud of their yeah, humility yeah. or whatever. And it has an edge to it. That's not loving, not submitted, not surrendered. What I think of, right. of weird and crazy in our day is the persecuted church that they, you know, uh, mm. like Muslims who become Christians who go back to their communities because they've got to share the message of Jesus with yeah, their family. Yeah. yeah. It's like the Samaritan woman and, she has this profound encounter with Jesus, John chapter 4, and she goes back to her people, the Samaritans, who are seen as um, not not orthodox, you know, not correct in their theology as as uh, compared to Jews. Paul, uh, sorry, Jesus says to her, salvation is from the Jews, meaning the Jews have it right, but she is a passionate advocate for the Messiah amongst her people, and surely that would have gotten her into trouble with some people. I'm thinking of a verse. I think it's in Acts. I wish I would have thought it during my prep time, but isn't there a passage? I'm pretty sure it's in Acts where the people feared 
the early believers, like enough where they didn't want to join them, but they did respect them. Do you remember that? You know what I'm talking about? Um, oh, I I'd have to, forward. I have to look yeah. specifically. Yeah. I mean, it could be the Bereans, but um, you know, I, I, W- the language of amazement is used throughout the book of Acts where people are amazed. And there's usually two things there. One is they've witnessed something really miraculous, but then also this uh, idea of like, we don't know what to do with this. There is that mm. kind of thing over and over and over again of these Christians doing things that are seemingly impossible, doing things that are really outside of the box. That's at the same time, um, inviting, maybe even compelling, but also kind of scary. Like we're venturing into new territory. Let me give you an example from church history. One of my fav- one of my heroes is William Carey, who was a British missionary to India, I think in the uh, 19th century. And um, he went there to proclaim Jesus amongst the Hindu people. And one thing he found when he got there was that Indians at the time, and you can look this up, they they practiced something called widow burning. So a woman, when her husband died, uh, felt compelled to kill herself, uh, mm-hmm. burning herself, wow. because if her husband's not alive, she shouldn't live either. It was this sort wow. of attachment to her spouse. And, and William Carey, as a compassionate Christian, started to lobby politically for the end of widow burning, arguing for the sanctity of the individual, whether man or woman. And he succeeded. He succeeded in advocating for the end of widow burning. That's that kind of radical, let's think about society differently. Let's bring a completely different ethic to society, which could be scary because you're threatening the status quo. But of course, Indians would never look back and and, and want widow burning. They say, okay, this was good and right. Wow. this I found the passage and then so did Angie. She's a uh, quick quick with the keys, I'll just say that. Here's the passage. The apostles were performing many miraculous signs and wonders among the people, and all the believers were meeting regularly at the temple in the area known as Solomon's Colonnade. No one else dared to join them, even though all the people had high regard for them. Yet more and more people believed and were brought to the Lord, crowds of both men and women. As a result of the apostles' work, sick people were brought out into the streets on beds and mats, so Peter's shadow might fall across some of them and they, right. as they went by. Crowds came from the villages around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those possessed by evil spirits, and they were all healed. That's radical. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the goodness of God in a dark world can be really scary, <laughs> and mm. his power. Um, but I love that Acts continues to mention... But it kept, it kept growing, you know, it kept thriving because the Holy Spirit was at work. Wow. Okay, when we come back, I want to pivot to c- contemporary times. And you wrote about how in the years of 2020, 2021, something changed in the church. People went online yeah. and some didn't come back. And why is that? We're going to just sort of take a look at the modern day church. And we, we love the church. Church is the right of Christ. But I think it's so good to know. Are we, um, have we watered down what it means to radically follow Jesus, you know, to trust him, to give our all to him? And, um, and is our Christianity compelling to people who are watching us? Like in the book of Acts, some may be afraid to join us, but they respect and regard us because we walk in power and humility and surrender in love in kindness. Our lives are marked by power. We pray for people. Things change. We submit to God and we love our enemies. That's a compelling Christianity. We'll talk about that with Dr. Nijay Gupta in a moment. Hi, I'm Susie Larson, host of Susie Larson Live. And I just have to pause, take a deep breath, and say thank you. With all my heart, thank you. You often hear me say, we can't do this without you, and we absolutely wouldn't want to. It's more important than ever that we be bold for Jesus, because we believe and know He's the hope of the earth, and you helped us do just that. So thank you for partnering with us so that we can partner with God to change the world. And if you've not given yet, you still have a chance to join us on this mission field. You can give now, safe and secure online, at MyFaithRadio.com.
Hope you're having a really great day. Thanks for tuning in to Suzy Larson Live. Honored to have as our guest today, Dr. Nijay Gupta. He's a Bible scholar and a deep thinker. His new book, Strange Religion, How the First Christians Were Weird, Dangerous, and Compelling, is just a deeply well-researched book, but also just gets you to think a little bit because we can so acclimate to even a watered-down version of Christianity without ever maybe challenging it within ourselves. But when we start to look at how the first believers walked and followed Jesus. It's just good because we can say, Lord, what what do I need to know? What do you want me to know? What do you want me to do? And you made this interesting observation about the modern church as we walk through 2020 and 21. People watched church online because churches were shut down. But then when church opened back up, not everybody returned. And you said this, they learned to live without church. And then they realized that they could live without church. So they did. Church was too normal. It competed with everything else going on, so it faded into the background of their lives. Sure, every now and again, there was a twinge of nostalgia mixed with guilt, a little nag that said, maybe you should go back. But for the many, that minor pang was not enough to inspire them to get up and to go out. Say more about that. Yeah, you know, I, you know, I mentioned I live in Portland, Oregon, which is one of the most unchurched parts of the United States. And that comes with challenges. I grew up in Ohio where there's just a lot of church uh, culture, church support, church community, a um, lot of favorability towards the church because of that. Um, here in Portland, it's not the same, but but um, that requires pastors to be passionate and innovative. Um, but it also means that when I talk to my neighbors, many of whom are not Christian, um, their perception of Christianity is largely negative. And that's because they listen to the news um, and w- when Christianity is in the news, it's usually bad. Um, and, and what I hear from my neighbors is church is the worst of American culture. Now, I know that's not true, but what they see in the news is that there are some churches and some Christians that um, just reflect and amplify the worst of our culture, including things like greed, narcissism, extreme individualism, sexism, classism, uh, economic discrimination, all of those things. And um, if if our church is just running on inertia, just running on kind of going through the motions, um, I can see how it just feels like nothing really um, powerful is happening in those spaces. Um, and I'm not expecting churches to be innovative all the time and do everything new, but I feel like if we are clinging to Jesus, we put – uh, what's in scripture and and what came from Jesus at the center it's going to it's going to cause friction with a lot that's in wider culture because the Jesus way is often different than the way of the flesh in the world and, so and what the I friction, noticed okay go ahead go ahead well well what I noticed with uh church often is um I think we you know I work with a lot of pastors what I notice is uh, churches often get into a rut where we just kind of do the same thing that we did the year before and the year before and the year before, but people's needs change and the world is changing. And so yeah. there has to be this kind of spirit led adaptability. I'm not saying get rid of sermons. I'm not saying get rid of worship, but this idea that um, we need to continue to be proclaiming and living the gospel in ways that are going to uh, to perk people up and wake people up. But what I really want, Susie, is I want people to get up on Sunday morning and say, I'm tired. I had a busy weekend. I have a lot of work, but I cannot miss church because there Amen. is power, power in those places. Hmm. Wow, so good. And I've got to say that when you think about the friction, when you think about what you're seeing in the media narrative, there is behind that, I feel like, an antichrist kind of mentality. There are, There's, you know, the enemy hates Jesus bride. Mm. So there's going to be people who love to find fault and there's plenty to find fault in. You know what I'm saying? So there's a weight yeah, of that yeah. of that um perspective that's just never giving the benefit of the doubt because for mm. all of the the narcissists and the you know self-serving leaders there are just a thousand more pastors yeah. in small rural churches or medium-sized churches giving mm-hmm. their lives for their flock. And so that Absolutely. said, I just feel like that's important. But on the other side, you know, I'm reading uh, Andrew Murray's Believing Prayer. I've read it umpteen times. It's this little book. Mm. I love it so much. But he talks about, you know, that one of the reasons you read the Word of God is to encounter the God of the Word, right? And then you sit with God 
and you follow him where he leads, you will encounter yeah. demons and mountains, which that's how your mm. faith grows. But if we're just trying to prop ourselves up, my paraphrase of a comfortable little Christianity, we won't, we won't have our faith challenged. But as we're facing, walking God with God, we're facing mountains and we're facing demons, which requires faith. It reminds me of uh, years ago, I had a, a, a rep from International Justice Mission on, we get them on every once in a while. And he had said, you know, there's times when you find pettiness or kind of a benignness in the church. He said, it's not because our problems are too big. It's because our problems are too small, that we mm. need to take on bigger problems. We need to enter into the world's suffering. Because I think where you see, you know, segments of Christianity doing that, you know, like the Dream Center in L.A. or places like that where you're going into the world and making a difference, they're so in over their head that if God doesn't show yeah. up, they're in big trouble. So I, yeah. you know, I feel like it's both and, don't you? Like there is an enemy that hates Christians, so he'll do whatever he can to spin a narrative and pick out the worst parts of, of who we are. But then there's this other piece that if we could engage with God, we wouldn't. I think we w- we would love this faith journey. As hard as it is, we wouldn't want to be anywhere else. Yeah, you know, one thing that I often say when people ask, what what made the early Christians so courageous and so radically different in all the best ways compared to sometimes in the modern world where we kind of get complacent? You know, I think of Philippians chapter 3 where Paul talks about losing all things to gain Christ. Mm -hmm. And he talks about his heritage. He talks about his Jewishness. The reality is, at the end of it all, he still was Jewish. But what he did was, I think of it like a Lego structure, and the early Christians, they took apart their whole lives piece by piece, and then they put Christ at the center, and they rebuilt everything around Christ, and they didn't put in anything that couldn't be aligned with Christ. Mm -hmm. And I think what often happens today, or what happens too often today, is um, we kind of start with the way of the world, and then we just try to inch closer to Jesus, but we may not get very far. And I think we have to really take that radical step of just taking everything apart and starting with Jesus. I think of the parable of the Pearl of Great Price, and this person doesn't negotiate. They just sell everything to buy the field to get the pearl. They're going to need clothes. They're going to need a house. They're going to need a horse. But they sell everything to get the pearl first. And then from that value system, they're able to bring everything back. And I think that's what made the big difference. That's what put them in the right place in the first place. Boy, and wouldn't you say that's uh, that's not a once and done choice? That's a daily, even moment by moment yeah. choice to keep Christ at the center because we're prone to wander, aren't we? Yeah, yeah. I think of Eugene Peterson's famous, you know, long obedience in the same direction. It's what you're talking about, Susie, is the long obedience, and that takes you know the early Christians use the term vigilance. Uh, being being fully awake, um, you know, and and that vigilance is about um, always always being aware, all have always having your wits about you. So as I'm thinking about you know the things that the world criticizes, I would rather be criticized for my passionate radical obedience of Jesus, my humble heart that you know that trusts Him in all things, mm. than being um, so annoying. Um, and calling it persecution <laughs> to, to Christianity. I think sometimes we maybe call something persecution that is really more uh, social chafing because <laughs> we need yeah, to be yeah. refined, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, I never want, um, you know, w- when I think about if I could wave a magic wand, Susie, and uh, have non Christians say one thing about Christians. Um, cause I think they would often hear where I live, they would say Christians are rude, closed minded. Um, I'm just trying to think about my actual neighbors, what they would say, parochial, um, old timey, you know, if I could wave a magic wand, I would want to s- them to say, these Christians are weird and they have weird beliefs, but they're good. Hmm. And let me tell you why I would want them to say that. Um, this is actually, I mentioned in my book. The name Christos, which is the word Christ, in Greek it's Christos, um, it didn't mean anything to Romans because it comes from the Jewish language of anointing. It literally means to smear in Greek. And so Romans would actually hear the word Christos as, they would mishear it as the name Christos or Christus. 
And the name Crestus was a very common slave name. And it meant useful or um, utilitarian. Often you named your slaves practical terms like Ampliatus means large person, uh, Urbanus means city dweller. Um, so Crestus means useful, useful person or utilitarian or tool, you might say. Uh, and so this was actually a smear against Christians by their early enemies. They would say, um, you're just slave people, you're Crestus, you're slave people. And in the second and third century, we actually have Christians who turn that into a positive because Crestus could also mean kindness. Hmm. So we have early Christian writers say, hey, you call us Crestus, you know, as a purposeful misinterpretation of Christos, but we actually claim that because we are the kind people. We're the people that take care of and look after the least, the last, and the lost. I just wow. love that. They, they actually so turned it into a badge of honor. What if, what if we were known for that? Hey, those Christians are weird. They have weird beliefs. They have weird practices and rituals, but they actually do a lot of good for the world. I would just love mm. if that's what we were known for. Boy, and wasn't that the case as well when uh, people said Jesus was a friend of sinners? They were using that as an accusation, and yet that really – isn't that true or not? Did I get that wrong? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I think about here in Portland, we have uh, a gentleman who does a lot of work with the homeless, and I remember asking him at, um, you know, at a gathering, you know, w what's it like, you know, how do people perceive you as someone that spends time, you know, because he'll, he'll spend – a lot of time with the homeless and he'll try to contextualize and, and be in their midst. And he says, you know, people walk by and they'll throw things at us just assuming I'm homeless as well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's just, I, I feel like that's a really good parallel for Jesus being a friend of sinners is he's willing to accept whatever reputation or trash talking that comes with to be with those who were kind of at the bottom of society. And don't you think that's just radical in a day? I mean, even back then, ego was king. Ego is king now too. But yeah, I mean, truly, yeah, absolutely. you know, how you presented, who you associated with, those were all identity issues. And for him to, you know, I think of in, in John's gospel, Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything, that he'd come from God and would return to God. And in his knowing, he picked up the towel and the basin. I mean, everywhere you turn when you look at Jesus, he mm. was living this. This is what they were modeling, the disciples. But it's like the king of the universe did what the lowliest slave would have done. And he's like, you've seen me do this. This is my paraphrase, of course. Now do as I've done. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's radical, isn't it? Well, even dying on a cross, we just can't understand yeah. in our time yeah. now how degrading and humiliating that would have been. Mm. Um, from Pompeii. We actually have graffiti, and in other places we have graffiti, so that we know that they would say, go get yourself crucified the way we would use the F word wow. to people. And so for Jesus wow. to identify with that, in fact, we have ancient writers that say you shouldn't use the word cross in polite conversation. Like if you're at a wow. dinner party, you shouldn't even say the word because it's vulgar. And here Jesus signed on for this. Um, and when he brought know, dignity it, to the cross, Nijay, because we were at the cross around our neck now, right? It, I mean, yeah, it's an amazing thing. It's yeah. an amazing thing to have accepted that, um, to transform that into um, into a symbol of love and redemption. I think about John chapter 13, where he says he loves them, he loved them to the end, yeah. to the very end, uh, means that he was willing to go the full distance to do anything to make things right in the world because of his love. Wow. Talking to Dr. Nijay Gupta. And I forgot to mention, friends, that we've got some copies of his new book to give away. So here we go. Strange Religion is the title. How the First Christians Were Weird, Dangerous, and Compelling. And he writes like he speaks. we got a handful of copies to give away. You can text the word book if you want in on the drawing, 877-933-2484. When we come back, I want you to just draw more distinction and clarity between modern American Christianity and the Jesus communities of the first century, because you said you're really struck by the differences. So let's talk about the differences. And are there any similarities? I want to learn from, from these first Christians. I want to learn from how Jesus lived, because it's amazing how much we can 
how easy it is to acclimate to culture without ever challenging what we do and why we do it. We'll be back in a minute. I pray you're having a really beautiful day. Thanks for tuning in to Suzy Larson Live, having a Super interesting conversation with our friend, Dr. Nijay Gupta. He's a biblical scholar. His book, Strange Religion, How the First Christians Were Weird, Dangerous, and Compelling. You can text the word book if you want in on the drawing. Text the word book to 877-933-2484. And Nijay, you said you're struck by the contrast between modern America and Christianity and the Jesus communities of the first century. And we've been touching on it, but I want you just right here right now, make a real clear distinction. And then let me know, are there any similarities that you see? Yeah, well, let's start with the similarities. I mean, I, I, I don't want to be a huge critic of the modern church in the sense that I think everyone's doing everything wrong. So I think the best churches that I go to that are the most authentically Jesus-centered, um, you know, there is uh, an openness to the Spirit. There's a commitment to the biblical tradition. There is a radical oneness of the people um, fidelity to Jesus Christ. But one of the things that really struck me about the early church is the choice to meet in houses. Um, one thing we know from the New Testament is churches met in homes, apartments, basically li li living spaces. And that was a radical departure from Roman religion. Roman religion was often performed in temples and in festivals, um, kind of in open air settings, that sort of thing with priests and material sacrifices. And it was often kind of more political and government oriented. You know, religious ceremonies often happened at government uh, kind of ceremonies. The Christian move to the household, Susie, was, I think, an intentional move to transfer religion from the realm of politics to really to the realm of the most intimate realm, which is that of family. And by meeting wow. in houses, they were practicing the most intimate form of relationship, which often happened in the family, brothers and sisters, parents and children. And the, the kind of key that unlocked that relationship was affection and love. Whereas in the public sphere, in the political space, it was about politics, obedience, um, appeasement, that sort of thing. But to put it in the household around a meal, you know, I don't know if a lot of Christians know this today, but in the ancient world, in the Roman world, you actually laid down to eat. So they, they would actually call the dining room the triclinium, which is the center room of laying down. And that center room had a table low to the ground and people would actually lay on their side and eat. So eating together was a very intimate experience. You know, I don't often eat with strangers. The most common experience I have would be at the airport. If there's like, if I'm at like a coffee shop at the airport and there aren't enough tables, I might, you know, sit down with a you know, group of people at a big table. But in the ancient world, you really only ate with people that you were close with. You didn't have these experiences where you're eating with strangers. And so for religious people to gather in a home setting with people's art all around and, you know, their kind of home furniture, to have this meal where you're laying down next to people of different ethnicities, social classes, economic scale, um, it sets up a whole new sociology. It sets up a whole new way of looking at the world. And this is what Christians were doing in the church. They were performing and reinforcing a whole new cosmological and social order to understand the world according to the kingdom of God, not according to the kingdom of the world. That's a really powerful thing. So this leads to one of my frustrations with modern church. If you can go to church and not talk to anybody, and not interact with anybody, and you just sit there listening to something and then go home, I don't think the early Christians would understand what was going on at all as mm. church. Church mm. is a community of people that are interacting with each other and with God for the building up and mutuality 
that indicates that they have had a transformative encounter with the living God. Uh, if you could watch it on TV, I think Paul would just be so upset that we think this is church. I think it's great to learn. I think it's great to listen to podcasts, watch YouTube videos. That's all good. That's all teaching, instruction, encouragement. But church really is a community that is helping, loving, caring, and supporting for one another. When in college, I went to this really small church, Nazarene church, maybe about 50, 60 people in the church. And there would just be a time of the service where uh, the pastor, one man show, the pastor would just say, what are the needs of the people? And people would literally get up and say, uh, my car is broken down. Can someone give me a ride to work tomorrow? And someone would be like, okay, I got you. Someone else would say, oh, wow. you know, I have this. Can someone help me move out my oven? I got to get a new oven, you know? Oh, okay, I'll help you with that. Like this little tiny Nazarene church in Southern Ohio was reflecting a deeper version of the we're here for each other as a family ideology, sociology of the church than many, most of the other churches I've been to. Wow. I'm thinking of Dr. Rob Reamer joins us once a month on the show. And one thing he said mm -hmm. is if you find yourself repenting of the same sin over and over again, not ever talking to others about it, mm -hmm. but just sort of kind of going solo. He says, you have a privatized religion. He said, yeah, you know, we yeah. are, we, you know, it's, remember what Jesus said, you know, confess your sins to God that you're forgiven, confess your sins to one another that you're healed. And the idea of community is necessity, necessity yeah, to yeah, being transformed. Yeah. And I'm trying to imagine these believers in this idolatrous culture, they're coming together around the table and it's, it's normalizing their faith. It's normalizing radical you know, trust. And, but if you are just truly, even if you're attending church, but you're keeping all the walls up and you kind of get a good facade on, you're not, life doesn't get in and life doesn't get out. And so yeah. uh, God wants something more for us in the way of community, doesn't he? Yeah. And, and also in the worship of Jesus, um, you know, I, I have a musician background. I play guitar and piano and sing. I love music. But I get really concerned that we have associated worship with music too much. Hmm. And um, worship has really nothing to do with music, except music can be a means of worship. Worship is ultimately reinforcing our value system around Jesus Christ. And it can be done hmm. in a million different ways. We're worshiping when we're um, when we're silent before the Lord. We're worshiping when we're praying. We're worshiping when we're... Uh, obeying scripture. I mean, all of those things are worship insofar as we are submitting ourselves to God and, and exalting Christ above any other thing, value, event, person. Um, and so one thing that was really fundamental to the early church is everybody had a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. It may look different from person to person, but it was really about a personal relationship with Jesus. I worry sometimes at church, we're just there for a teaching from a pastor or a teacher or a leader. I love good sermons. I love good teaching. Those are all resources that benefit us in our journey of knowing God personally. And ultimately, what we want from the believers in our churches is, are they growing personally closer to Jesus, not through a pastor or a leader? Hmm. Wow. I want to read this. She said, it was more the case that the person of Christ, the work of the Spirit, and the fundamental dynamics of the gospel themselves changed their orientation toward God, God's world, God's creatures, and God's good end. That made Christians seem like aliens from another planet. And that context was the difference between those who worshipped all of these small g gods. I want you to hear this again. It was more for these Christians the case that the person of Christ— the work of the Spirit and the fundamental dynamics of the gospel themselves change their orientation toward God, God's world, God's creatures, and God's good end. That made Christians seem like aliens from another planet. Reminds me, Nijay, of another part of this little book from Andrew Murray, where he talked about there are times when Christians go as far as they can to the edges of what's lawful. It doesn't matter if it's not profitable. I want to get as yeah. much of the world, uh, I want to have as much license as I can. And, uh, and still call it Christianity. 
But he said, it's those who get before God to say everything, anything, show me, Lord, I want to walk in your way, that really, he said, start to see power in their prayers and even power in their footsteps. And I think, you know, it, that kind of stuff is so easy. We acclimate more than we even realize. And uh, that's, I feel like this is maybe a bit of a pivot. Maybe we'll talk about this on the other side of the break. But just even the idea of fasting, um, mm. because that was a part of the early church. And, and you're hearing more about it these days. But what, what role that might play, and especially when you live in a nation where you can have anything you want at the click of a button. Yeah, you know, yeah. when we really can have access to what we want, when we want it. And, the, you know, there, I think that the idols of, of convenience and comfort um, are alive and well today in our midst. So what would that mean for us? What might God be asking of us and from us that we could know him on a deeper level? Dr. Nijay Gupta is my guest today. His book is Strange Religion, How the First Christians Were Weird, Dangerous, and Compelling. We'll talk more with Dr. Nijay in just a moment. Hi, I'm Suzy Larson, host of Suzy Larson Live. I've got a question for you. Do you have a deep desire buried in your heart that you've tucked away and haven't thought about for a long time? I'm daring you to bring it up again. Bring it before the Lord. Put it on the forefront of your mind. Start to pray about it. Talk to a friend about it. Search scripture because of it. God delights in every detail of your life, and he truly wants to fulfill some of the deepest desires of your heart. Connecting Faith to Life, Faith Radio. Thanks so much for tuning in to Suzy Larson Live, having a really just wonderful conversation with our friend Dr. Nijay Gupta. He's a Bible scholar, and he's written the book, Strange Religion, How the First Christians Were Weird, Dangerous, and Compelling. And you were saying, we talked about this earlier in the show, that they Christians, the early Christians weren't trying to be weird for weird's sake. They wanted to really follow Jesus wholeheartedly, submit their whole lives, reorient their whole lives to him, while at the same time living respectable, being respectable and living as good members of society. And you said it was more of the case that the person of Christ, the work of the Spirit, and the fundamental dynamics of the gospel themselves changed their orientation toward God, towards God's world, God's creatures, and God's good end. That made Christians seem like aliens from another planet. And just given that, I didn't expect to go in this direction, but I do want to ask you about, say a word if you would about fasting, especially you know, living in our society when we can have what we want when we want it. It's not a bad thing to, to buffet our flesh, to say no to our flesh at times so we can make space to really press in to know the Lord in a deeper way. Yeah, you know, ultimately fasting was an exercise of trust, um, an exercise of um, recognizing that God can take care of us and God calls us to hunger and thirst for him alone. I also think, uh, Susie, about Sabbath. Sabbath and fasting are very mm, similar. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, and my friend A.J. Swoboda, who I know that you've had some connection to, uh, he wrote a wonderful book, Subversive Sabbath. And um, I think in our time now, yeah, food uh, is this place where we need to learn how to rely on God. But also time. You know, I'm one of these people. I love to be productive. I love to get more and more work done. And Americans are famous for overworking um, and trying to get ahead. And what does it mean to intentionally take time off and not be, quote unquote, productive so it can be fully present before the Lord? Uh, and the same thing with fasting. You know, it was this radical practice. Now, Christians weren't the only ones that fasted. Jews fasted as well. But it's this radical practice of saying no sometimes to our bodies to kind of be fully present to the Lord. And and both food practices of Jews and Christians and Sabbath were ways that they were criticized by the Romans for just being weird and doing things that were seemingly backwards. But I think this is kind of just part and parcel of being Christian. When you live in a non-Christian environment like I do here with my teenagers, sometimes I tell them, you just need to tell your friends, oh, I do this because I'm Christian, and just let, help them understand it's okay to be different. So for example, like cussing, a lot of my a lot of my son's friends cuss, and he doesn't. And, you know, when they come over, you know, we'll tell them, you know, we don't cuss in this house. And he'll have to explain to them, you know, we just believe in good speech. Uh, we believe in respect, respectable speech. 
And I have to help my kids understand we need to learn to just be okay with being different. And mm-hmm. that happens with fasting. It happens with Sabbath. It happens, you know, I think of Eric Little. Do you remember the story of Eric Little? Mm-hmm. Uh, Chariots of Fire. And yeah. he's this... Uh, he's this runner who doesn't run on the Sabbath and, you know, that sort of thing. And what does it mean to hold true to these commitments? Even if the world's going to find us bizarre, even if sometimes we're going to be rejected because of it, we say God's ways are, are higher than the ways of the world. We just have to understand it's going to come out right. And don't you think they're, you know, I mean, who was it? Oswald Chambers, I think, said, let God be as original with others as he is with you. And in that light, I mean, he leads us all differently. What might be yes. maybe sinful or just indulgence for me might not be for you. And I think we love to make rules and laws. And maybe you've had an encounter with God and he's saying no more of this. And then you want to turn around and make it a rule for everybody else. And somehow, some way, we've got to walk in the spirit and not gratify the desires of the flesh. I remember reading, mm-hmm. uh, if I think I got this right, but Dr. Jack Hayford uh, loved chocolate. But because of that, because of just he wanted to buffet his body and stay in constant dependence on the Lord, it's one of those things he said no to himself. He loved it, but he's like, I'm just not going to have it. I just want to exercise that no muscle when it comes to my flesh. And then you think of Billy Graham. He wouldn't get in an elevator or a car alone with another woman. And he got so much criticism for that. But scandal mm. never darkened his doorstep. You know, you can make fun of him all day long, but he had that conviction, and some thought that weird. And don't you think that as we listen for the Lord, we've got to break free from the fear of the of man if God's asking us to do something that is very specific to who we are? Absolutely. And, and I think this is what made the early Christians so powerful and compelling is— um, they weren't afraid of the world, uh, you know, the, the the apostolic community. They weren't they weren't afraid of um, managing expectations, managing reputation. They were just saying, "We're going to go all in on this Jesus thing, come what may." And it's that "come what may" part that I think we often compromise on. I I, even, I often compromise on it. You know, if, if I'm on an airplane, someone asks me, what do I do? <laughs> mm-hmm. Sometimes it's hard for me to say, I'm a seminary professor. I, here in Portland, Oregon, that doesn't buy me a lot of goodwill mm. culturally <laughs> in the way it does when I visit my parents in Ohio, where you, growing up um, in Ohio, uh, clergy got all sorts of free stuff at businesses, and you could go to mm-hmm. Cleveland Indians games for free. We don't get that here in Portland, <laughs> Oregon. <laughs> so do I hide my faith, or do I just... You know, one thing my wife has helped me understand better is by being bold and saying I'm a Christian, I'm actually trying to get my neighbors to rethink what Christianity is based on me. Wow. And, wow. you know, be able to say, hey, I know you've met some Christians who have been hypocrites, mean spirited. I'm a Christian too. And I try to do better and I'm not perfect, but, you know, and so we just need to be more willing to express our faults, be more genuine, that sort of thing. Wow, so good. You talked about, we just got a few minutes left, but how the Romans were more obsessed with compliance than they were with belief. And then you say the Christians were obsessed with belief. And I'm just going to read a few quick passages and have you speak to it as we get ready to wrap here. But you reference, these are all from Scripture. Your faith has made you well. If you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here, and it'll move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Did you receive the Spirit by doing the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Night and day, we pray most earnestly that we see you face to face and restore whatever's lacking in your faith. And you reference a few more, but talk about that distinction. Yeah, you know, what's amazing about Judaism and Christianity, Old Testament, New Testament, um, let's say, is how much emphasis there is on heart and mind and conscience. And Roman religion didn't really reflect on these things. You you did your ritual, you did your sacrifice, you appeased the gods, and that's it. The gods don't care what you believe, what you care about. They just want to know that you're going to comply with sort of a cold obedience. But what's interesting is even from the beginning of the Old Testament, love the Lord your God with your heart, with your soul, with all your strength, this idea that God knows that what we really care about is going to be internal. It's going to be where our heart is. And so it's amazing to me that we have so many passages in the New Testament that talk about conscience, what's going on inside of us, which is kind of like integrity, authenticity. 
And I think the Christians were ahead of psychology, the development of psychology, by showing that our real behavior is going to begin with what's inside of us. You know, mm-hmm. you, you can ask for compliance all you want, but to really turn someone's life, you got to turn their mind and heart. And mm-hmm. the, the Bible talks about that from the beginning, that it's got to be heart, mind, and spirit. Amen. Well, Dr. Nijay, our time is up, and I'm looking forward to future conversations with you. But thank you for such a, a well-thought-out book. It's just amazing, and we love any time we get with you. Thank you, sir. Yeah, my pleasure. Dr. Nijay Gupta is my guest. His book, again, Strange Religion, How the First Christians Were Weird, Dangerous, and Compelling. I just challenge you to sit with God to ask Him, what does obedience look like in this season? How can I honor you with my life in this season? And then do what He says. He's worth it. Appreciate your listening today. We'll meet you back here next time. Thank you for listening to this conversation from Suzy Larson Live. These conversations are available because of your support. You can become a supporter now at MyFaithRadio.com. Please subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss any episodes and then share it with friends so together we can all have a deeper life in Christ.